House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. You are back in the House of Mystery. Of course, I'm Al Warren, Mr. John Copenhavers. Hey, Al, how you doing? Still can't smell or taste. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah, what's it, three three months almost or something? Maybe maybe by the end of the year you will be tasting and smelling the gun. I hope. That's my wish. <laughs> yeah. I can't I don't none of that Christmas smell. No cin- cinnamon, no eggnog, no oh. r- no roast turkey, no nothing. It's all gone. Okay, let's just uh jump in today. Um we've got a great writer here, um, a Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist. So Mr. Edward Humes, thank you for being on the show. I'm so happy to be here. And sorry to hear about your taste buds. Um, <laughs> well, that COVID, you know, the, I got it in when I was interviewing in Seattle at the uh, Seattle studio, and I was feeling fine until I had... Uh, Ann Bremner, who's a Seattle lawyer, I've known quite quite a long time, and we and I interviewed her, and during that interview, I had this really weird dry cough, came uh. out of nowhere, and then uh, that was it. Three days later, I was down for the count, <laughs> and the smell and taste were gone, and they still haven't come back. Well, you know, my uh, good friend and agent Susan Ginsburg had that same. Uh, symptom that it seemed aftermath both her and her husband um particularly her for um and this was early in the covid days but about six months later she got it all back which is really good because she's a complete foodie so i feel so bad for her but if you've only been three months in uh have heart you're gonna get it back yeah. well i hope so you know um i i could have been so much worse right so i'm i'm fortunate as as it is but i just uh it is so bizarre to try and eat something, and it's completely by texture, no flavor and no smell. That is really a strange thing. Edward, now what brought you to this book? This, this, uh, The Forever Witness is the book, and it's a true crime book. So um, how, did, how did this process start? Well, you know, this is... One of the Pacific Northwest's most enduring mysteries, um, the murder of a young couple on an overnight trip to Seattle in November 1987. Uh, literally generations of detectives and the best crime labs in the world were, were stumped for decades. And 30-plus years later, I'm watching the news, and there's an announcement that this case had been solved, and it was done through this new thing that uh, not too many people in the public understood what exactly it was. It was called genetic genealogy, and it kind of sounds like an eye-glazing term, but it's it's powerful and revolutionary and really cool, and it was unfolding practically in my backyard and right on the heels of uh, a sensational case uh, that was supposed to be one of a kind, the Golden State Killer case, and you know, weeks later somebody else used exactly the same method to to end this long-standing mystery and bring answers to the families. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, boy, I'd read a book about this. And then I said, what the heck? Maybe I could write a book about this. And uh, uh, and here we are. Well, I know I think it's fascinating because I remember that in uh, interviewing a lot of the uh, DNA Doe Project people oh, yeah. that were getting things and, you know, they were doing the drawings and getting it from 23andMe and stuff like that. And, uh, there was all sorts of stuff. It seemed it seemed rather exciting. It seemed unorganized, but rather exciting. Um, I, I think it's pretty amazing that it's come that far. What are your thoughts on it? Do you think this is just the beginning? Well, it's been a few years now, and um, there's been quite a few cold cases solved that were basically unsolvable with other methods. What's so different and fascinating about this is we're, we're basically crowdsourcing murder investigations through this new technology because it doesn't come from 
the, the big CSI experts in crime labs or the Justice Department it doesn't even come. This technique doesn't come out of the law enforcement world. It comes out of the hobbyist world and the, the citizen scientists who are playing around with these new but extremely powerful home DNA test kits. You know, the people get under the Christmas tree or for birthday gifts or on you know on sale online for sixty nine bucks. Uh, and nobody in the in the criminal justice world ever really thought there was anything of value for them in there. And and here you have people like C. C. Moore, the genetic genealogist who worked on the, the the case in the Forever Witness, who started out exploring her own roots, and then she'd blog about it, and people would contact her and say, "Can you help me? I'm adopted, and I can't find my birth parents." And next thing you know, she's finding the birth parents of adopted kids, the birth families. And that's a process that's shrouded in secrecy and confidentiality. And yet this this new technique could pierce that in a in a heartbeat. Uh, and then she was helping amnesiacs find their identity and foundling babies who had no idea where they came from. It was only just one step further to say, hey, if I have a, a, a person who has no identity and can find their identity, uh, by having them spit in a tube and send it off to a lab, why can't I do the same thing with a crime scene evidence that it would be exactly the same process? And that's literally how this this development came to be basically a cold case solving machine. And and a lot of these places, like twenty three and me and stuff like that, that's all voluntary, right? Like people just put it in or they just get a test for whatever. Uh, like you say, they're trying to find their parents or they're trying to find oh, yeah. whatever. They stick it in there and then it's in the file and they just have to click on the box. Yeah, they, that they could uh, use it in searching and of course so, and that's kind of how it's gone. Yeah, and, and it's uh, any one person's DNA uh, profile which is generated by these services like Ancestry and 23andMe it has no power on its own, but when you put it into a database with millions of others who are sharing them to see, hey, is there some little part of your DNA that indicates you're a distant relative? Yes, and then you both put it on your family tree and then another and then another, that the power is in the numbers. Um, and then if you make the decision to download you know, that profile from one of these private companies, which do maintain confidentiality, and they don't let law enforcement come in and, and search their databases for the most part. Most of them don't. Um, but there are places, uh, a service called GenMatch is one, where you pool your resources from all these different DNA companies. And so if I have a profile from Ancestry and you have one from 23andMe, we could both upload them to the same shared database. And you're increasing your reach and power uh, of, of searching for your your roots, your origins, your family, and and that's the database that the police have used um, among among several to solve a lot of these crimes. And and there you're making this affirmative decision to say, yeah, I'm going to put my 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 genetic profile out into the world and and see what happens. Now I would guess in a matter of time, but as this becomes more of a regular occurrence and how it's becoming popular and catching criminals and killers and stuff like that, that people that actually are the bad guy out there um, might avoid doing this sort of thing then. You mean uh, not commit the crimes? Yeah. Well, I, no, I mean, that would be, no, I mean, <laughs> wouldn't that be nice? No, they're going to commit the crime. But instead, they're just never going to go to any of these uh, ancestry places. They're just never going to do any searches. Actually, that's not really, they don't have to. That's where the real power of this is. So, you know, we've been hearing, I'm sure your listeners know that DNA in one way or another has been used for, for decades in, in crime solving. It was a, a forensic revolution, and, and it's been around for a while. But the process that the law enforcement has always used is called DNA fingerprinting. It's a very apt analogy because there are little structures inside our genes um, that act just like your finger fingerprints. It's a unique identifier, but it doesn't tell you 
these little structures, they're, really, they're easy to map and easy to upload into a database. And to, you can take them just like you take a fingerprint uh, when you arrest somebody. But they don't tell you anything about who a person is related to or what color eyes they're going to have. It's not part of the coding sequences in your DNA. It's just kind of junk DNA. Um, but it's great to generate these fingerprints. And when you get one of these fingerprints, there's only one person in the world who can have it. So it's a perfect identifying tool. But the problem with that system is that somebody has to be caught for something and have their DNA fingerprint uploaded into this massive Justice Department database in order to find them. If they've never been caught, they're invisible to the system, and the DNA doesn't help you. This genetic genealogy, this new development, it's revolutionary because you don't have to have a person's DNA to find them. That's where the crowdsourcing part comes in. All you have to do is have a couple of distant relatives in the system, and bingo. You can build their family tree until you find the person who's the exact match. You can find people who have never submitted for a DNA test this way because, well, when you upload, if you were a customer of one of these gene testing companies, you're not just uploading your own DNA, you're uploading your entire family's DNA. Was it sort of, um, it was kind of a, for lack of a better word, almost by hand tracing these uh, family trees back. Is that still the case or is there, you know, programs or, or, you know, systems which is help, which are actually helping people do this? Yeah, well, I mean, genealogy has been around for, well, almost as long as there's been civilization in one form or other way. And that's simply genealogy is the, your family tree, it's, or it's rather creating your and tracing your family tree. And typically in the past that's been done with oral histories, family, you know, Family stories passed on from generation to generation, old photos, and, and, but also documents, marriage records, death records, um, birth records, uh, notices in the newspaper, uh, and that sort of thing. And that process still is going on, but you can combine it with the information you glean from these DNA tests and this database. Uh, and com when you combine the two, that's when it becomes incredibly powerful. You, either one by itself doesn't achieve the, the kind of results we're seeing in these cold case cells, but together, um, it's really quite spectacular. Now, if you're a, a regular consumer, some of these companies have a really nice system where it will populate your family tree with, um, public record hits because all these records are online now, as well as the DNA match results. And it kind of does a lot of it for you. But to investigate these cold cases, it takes someone who's quite adept at this kind of genealogical research to really drill down and, and find people who, uh, who are just unknowns from crime scene DNA. Yeah, that was a pretty fascinating job they did with the Golden State Killer. You know, the way they uh, kind of narrowed in on the family and then they started looking at all the other people in the family and the men and started, you know, deciding who could have and who couldn't have. And they just all put it together piece by piece. Um, that was quite a job. Yeah, and that's that's how it has worked in all these cases. And you can see how there's a direct line from um, uh, trying, uh, trying to identify the birth uh, family of an adopted person, or you mentioned the DNA Doe project. That's uh, um, a project that attempts to identify the un unknown uh, dead. Um, you know, typically, they go to the morgue and they're called Jane Doe or John Doe uh, because they don't know their true identities. Um, so it's it's been really useful for that. Um, the technology is now being used for um, unidentified um, military deaths as well, when um, the other d older DNA methods haven't been able to get an identification. So, yeah, there's a lot going on in this realm that's accomplishing things that were never before possible. So now let's move on up to, into your case here, the case that you've got going on for your new book, The Forever Witness. Um, so 
What was the, the basic premise of the case? What had happened back in 1987? Yeah, it was November 1987, so just a little bit more now than, uh, than uh, 35 years ago. And um young woman, Tanya Van Kylen Borg, uh, 18 years old, and her boyfriend, Jake Cook, who was 20, living on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. Um, Jake's dad had a... It's a lovely place, by the way, and uh, we spent some time with the families there and, and visited where Jay and Tanya grew up, and it's it's Canada's only Mediterranean climate. It's, it's this uh, beautiful place, and in 1987, it was the kind of place where it was safe and it had a small town feel. Uh, people didn't lock their doors when they left because there's you know there was no reason to, uh, and that's the kind of world that uh, Tanya and Jay grew up in, and. Um, they w- undertook an errand for Jay's dad to help out his business. Uh, they need to pick up some parts for his uh, heater service and supply business. And uh, Jay invited Tanya to come along. They'd drive down to Seattle. It would be a couple of ferry rides and a, and a drive in between. Um, and that way they could sort of have their first road trip together and spend some time together and also do a favor for, for Jay's dad. And we know from how their route was retraced that they uh, crossed from the island uh, across the Salish Sea, about 25 miles to the Washington coast on the Olympic Peninsula, beautiful kind of wild area of undeveloped coastline and rainforest. And they began driving south uh, towards Bremerton, a port city uh, at the lower end of the peninsula. And, they were going to get on a ferry and go to downtown Seattle where they would sleep in their van overnight and pick up the parts in the morning, spend the day hopping around Seattle and then head home. Well, we, whatever happened after Bremerton is unknown exactly because they never made it to their destination. He never called. They didn't return in, uh, when expected the next day. And, uh, you know, the family was frantic, but a little less than a week later, the call came that um, their bodies had been found in different locations, and um, they had been brutally murdered by persons or persons unknown. Wow. So what happened at the time? What kind of investigation did they do, and what what was the theory um, of the murders back in the late 80s? Well, you have to remember how... Uh, what the world was like in 1987. Uh, it was pre cell phone. You know, there was no pervasive cans and traffic cans or any other kind of cans around. There was no facial recognition. Some of the tools that we take for granted in criminal investigation for tracking the movements of both victims and suspects just didn't exist. Um, but this was also an international case. You know, every agency from the local Sheriff's departments where the bodies were found, to the state police in Washington, to the, the FBI and the, uh, you know, the Royal Canadian Mounties, you name it. They were involved in, in this international investigation to figure out what happened, where it happened, and who did it. Um, but, uh, the, notwithstanding really heroic efforts by, Law enforcement by the families putting up a reward, doing their own searches. Uh, this evidence was scant. There was no eyewitnesses. There was to the crime or anything close to it. Uh, in the end, they had a palm print that they couldn't identify from the back of the van and traces of the DNA of the killer uh, on Tanya and in the van and a few other places. And that was it. They, were, they found evidence of a murder kit with gloves and extra bullets um, for, for the gun that was used to kill Tanya. Um, and at every crime scene, and the bodies were found 60 miles apart, um, at every crime scene there were um, these plastic ties, zip ties, that the police believed were used as, uh, as temporary handcuffs. And that linked together all the crime scenes and, and uh, both where the van was found and where the bodies were found. And then that was it. 
they, they had no idea who did it. And the tips poured in from the public. There was huge publicity, but none of them panned out. Um, and then the uh, police developed the theory that this seemed to be the work of a serial killer. Um, both bodies were kind of left on display by uh, by roadsides uh, in different locations. The, um, although the method of killing, strangulation of Jay and shooting of Tanya were very different, they felt that this was someone who had prepared for the crime, had stalked their victims, and uh, would either had done this before or would do it again. So they were thinking a serial killer uh, at that point as the most likely target. And they checked them all out because there was a lot of them operating in that part of the world at the time. And they could never link Jay and Tanya's killer to any other crime. So the case went cold. Now, I, I've also read that uh, both the victim's parents' families had received uh, a series of taunting greeting cards. Oh, yes. yes. Featuring graphic descriptions of the murders. Um, you know, and they were postmarked from Seattle, L.A., and New York. Um, wow. that that That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, that was, they started um, in the holiday season, you know, a month, a little more than a month after. Jay and Tanya were were killed. Um, both parents and the police in Canada received these awful letters and holiday cards uh, claiming credit for the for the crimes and talking, uh, you know, laughing and mocking the the victims and their their families. It, it was horrifying. And, you know, as if this, these families hadn't been dealing with enough pain and loss than to have these ominous and vile letters show up, um, one after another, taunting the police, mocking the victims. It was just, uh, it was horrible. Uh, and, and they were slightly deranged. The police weren't sure what to make of them. On the one hand, you have to take seriously. And anonymous, anonymous letters claiming credit for the killings. Uh, on the other hand, there was no information in them that you couldn't have gotten from watching the news or reading uh, the newspaper. So they weren't sure that this was uh, real or just a cruel hoax uh, from from some, you know, mentally uh, ill person. Uh, of course, they investigated, but they were unable to trace the the letters either. Um, so many years later, uh, when uh, uh, Detective Jim Scharf took over the case, he had been a, a sheriff's deputy in 1987 who patrolled the area where Jay Cook was found in the, for the Sonoma, Sonomish County Sheriff. Um, years later, he became, he, uh, he was appointed to lead the cold case team there, and he took up Jay and Tanya's case. And he tracked down that letter writer uh, when no one else could. He's he's quite a remarkable detective. And he he, he uh, had a partner interviewed him. They found him. He had become a homeless person. He used to um, live and teach in Canada, and he had fallen on hard times. And when they caught up with him, he burst into tears and apologized and said, I, I did write those letters, and I've regretted it all my life, but I didn't do the do the murders i would never do that and uh, he voluntarily let let uh, detective sharf take his dna and they compared his dna fingerprint to the crime scene and he was not the killer and he had just done, written these terrible letters he wasn't prosecuted because the statute of limitations for that kind of harassment had long since passed um, so the investigation succeeded in getting the only real suspect they ever had, the letter writer, but they cleared him uh, rather than finding the killer. So it was massively disappointing to the family that had gotten their hopes up that after all those years, something would uh, be done on the case. And there were many disappointments like that 
uh, on their long journey for, for justice. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's quite a person to do something like that. Send letters like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, you end up, I frankly, you end up feeling sorry for that person rather than vilifying the, uh, you know, there's always an explanation for people's bad choices and, and his was a, was one that, you know, you, you, you're horrified by what the person did, but I think he ended up paying, paying uh, for his crimes with his own self-loathing at what he had done before the story was over. You know, Jim Sharf, I, I'll tell you a little bit about him because I, the characters in this book, the people I met who lived this loss and, and this investigation, uh, is a remarkable ensemble of, of people. And um, if you read The Forever Witness, the Detective Sharp is kind of your guide throughout the book. He's, he's sort of the, the character that knits, knits the disparate elements of the story together. But he he's a career cop. He lives and breathes. Uh, well, I would say blue, you know, LAPD blue kind of thing, but it actually lives in three khaki because that's what the sheriff's department wears. Uh, and he, um, this is the kind of guy who is an expert marksman. He's arrested literally hundreds of violent criminals in his career. And yet he has never used his firearm. He's never actually, you know, shot it off the, off the, uh, target range. You know, he's, he, he believes there's always a better way than using that level of force to, to do what he needs to do. And I, I just thought that was, he kind of was very offhand of it. But I thought that's, that's a record to be, to celebrate and to be proud of. And he's, he was the most successful in his department for getting suspects to confess. He once hugged <laughs> defendant and suspect into confessing. Uh, you know, uh, it's just he uses empathy as his tool and he's been very effective. And his, his frustration at not being able to bring answers to, to, uh, the families of Tanya and Jay just was, was palpable. And he takes, takes that very personally. So he was a remarkable character to, to write about. And I was, I was very pleased to be able to do that. So by the time then, after this is all said and done, um, did he have anybody, um, in mind as the killer? Did he have a suspect that he thought for sure was the killer? But they just couldn't prove it. He he tried he tried many suspects, and he would do things like well, he'd ask some of them to uh, you know, he'd get a tip, and and somebody would say, oh, so and so bragged about killing this couple years ago, and um, uh, and leaving one of the bodies under High Bridge, which is where Jay was found. So he'd hunt that person down and get them to give them a DNA sample, or he'd follow them around until he got something with. With the person's DNA on it. Uh, one time he got a tip from someone who swore the person they saw on the ferry with Jay and Tanya all those years ago, you know, it would have been 25 years ago, I saw him in the checkout line in, in Walmart, and he went through every receipt on the proper day <laughs> from Walmart until he finally found the person who was checking out next door to this this tipster and tracked that person down and got his DNA. He, he went to such lengths to find, uh, check out every lead, no matter how much of a long shot it was. And the DNA always cleared the suspect and it never matched. And then uh, he heard about this process of genetic genealogy that was used to identify, um, uh, uh, adoptees and kidnapped children who had been kidnapped so early that they didn't know where they came from. They can remember. And he read about a case that like that. He said, wow, this is the kind of thing that could solve my cold cases. And he started looking around for someone to, to do that. And ultimately he, um, he was able to work with CC Moore. Uh, the genealogist who ended up breaking that case. Um, and she's an interesting story too. She's not a scientist. She, she was, 
her career and her education was an actress and a singer. She did TV commercials and musical theater. She even had a gig as uh, Barbie come to life uh, for Mattel Company <laughs> and, and toy trade shows. And But her passion, her hobby, uh, were two things. She loved puzzles and she loved genealogy. And when these DNA tests... These consumer tests came online. She she embraced them and and became part of a this small community that the uh, citizen scientists who pushed the envelope on how to use these tests to do more than just find out the name of your great grandma, but to really um, pierce all the secrets that plague us, adopt the children's identities or. Uh, she was working on fertility doctor scandals where the you know the the, the parentage was not what it was supposed to be, and um, she began to realize that she could solve crimes this way. And she actually went to a conference of one of the major conferences on human identification, where leading experts in DNA in law enforcement um, discussed the cutting edge technology, and she's told them that, hey, you know, what I'm working on now goes way beyond uh, finding great-grandma. We could you know, be solving some of these crimes that you're not able to do through other means. And they were not receptive to, to this, this upstart a former actress who uh, was working with DNA tests on sale on Amazon for 69 bucks, you know, they, she was going to show them something about, uh, with their million dollar, billion dollar crime labs and technology. They, they just didn't see anything there. And of course, she proved them to be quite wrong. And now she like leads sessions at the same conference explaining how to do it to the experts, the so called experts. I guess that's kind of a, some just desserts, but her her only desire was to help these these people who who desperately wanted answers, the families of these victims. She has solved 250 cold cases since she started with Jay and Tanya's case in mid-2018, and there's only been 400 solved by everybody working in this genetic genealogy field, so she literally has solved more cold cases than anyone on the planet in any in any place. Um, and that's just remarkable. That's amazing. You know, um, so after that, case pretty much went cold. And uh, when did they discover something? Or how did, how did it come about where they actually um, looked for the DNA of this case and, and thought they'd check it? Yeah. Well, they had the DNA from the crime scenes since 1987. There wasn't much they could do with it in 1987. You know, that was the year that the first trial using DNA in America occurred that year. It just wasn't widely used. Um, so they stuck it in a freezer and said, someday we're going to be able to do something with this. You know, And then 10 years later, they bring it out of cold storage and they enter the DNA profile into the FBI's DNA fingerprint database with high hopes. Nothing. Drew a blank because the offender wasn't in there. And then along comes genetic genealogy and the Golden State Killer case and C.C. Moore, and they uh, found a match this time. C.C., in two hours of, of working on the profile, um, came up with a name. She reverse engineered the family tree of uh, two second-level cousins uh, of, that seem to be the closest relations in the database to the killer. And then CC had to figure out where the two sides of that family came together because one second cousin seemed to be related to the killer's mom and the other to the killer's dad. So where did those two lines cross? So she kept building that family tree until she found uh, a common great grandparent that united the lines and then built that tree forward until she found uh, the marriage that uh, produced the children that could fit the killer's profile. And there was four children of that marriage. 
only three of them, uh, three of them were women, and the killer had to be a man, so that just left one suspect. So she was literally able to give Detective Sharp a single name, and she found his address and his other information and, and passed it on. Jim Sharp is, is his day off. Uh, he lives on a small farm in Snohomish County um, with his wife and two rescue horses, and he was out walking one of his, both of his pugs, and he gets a call, and they say, well, we've got a name for you in the Jimmy and Tanya's case. And he kind of laughed and said, yeah, right. Uh, he was expecting to get a whole list of names that he'd have to check out. And, and he, you know, they probably wouldn't lead anywhere because that's what always happened in these cold cases. And the, the caller says, no, no, we just have a single name. His name's William Earl Talbot II. And this is, and he lived, this is where he lived. It was only seven miles from where, uh, Jay's, ha Jay's body was found and all this other information. And, Detective Sharp couldn't believe it. It was more than he ever dreamt would be possible. And finally he was able, he had a name, and he was able to open up a full investigation of of this man that C.C. Moore had identified, William Earl Talbot II. Do you think, you know, I've been sort of reflecting on your um, sort of description of this, you know, the, the process that C.C. went through, and then, you know, your description of Jim Sharp being... Uh, you know, taking different approaches to policing. Like, is this, you know, are we seeing new trends sort of come, you know, pop up in policing? Or is this really going to start changing the way, uh, essentially, we go about solving crime? I mean, I guess maybe we're talking about cold case here, so maybe not in all cases. But um, I don't know. It seems sort of like a theme I'm seeing when you're speaking. So I was curious what you thought. <laughs> I think it, it is revolutionary. It has the potential to become a much, uh, to go way beyond just these old, uh, cold cases. That was the first application. But, but actually there's been a case where, uh, and it caused some controversy over the privacy aspects of it, but there was a case in, uh, Utah in which a church organist was assaulted and, uh, it was just out of the blue. Somebody broke in, um, strangled her. Uh, it was a brutal crime, but she survived. Um, and the killer cut himself on the glass of the window he broke through, and so he left his DNA behind. He wasn't in any database. His, his DNA fingerprint didn't, there was no match. And so they wanted, um, CC Moore to do a, do a genetic genealogy search, not for a cold case, but for an active one that it was under primary investigation. And, and they were afraid this uh, suspect might strike again. So um, they were able to identify this very active uh, attempted murder suspect through genetic genealogy. So its application is could be for any crime in which biological evidence is left behind. The catch is that the, this data, this public database of, of um, consumer DNA test results that uh, we talked about a little earlier called GEDmatch has used to be run by a couple of hobbyists themselves. It was a labor of love. It was a passion project. You know, there was a couple of servers in a in a retiree's Florida bungalow when it started out, and yet this little. Um, uh, passion project was incredibly powerful because it had a million DNA profiles in it. And that's enough to find almost anybody because, you know, we're all related at some level and a million DNA profiles is a very powerful sample. Um, that little, uh, passion project has been bought up by a large company and perhaps unsurprisingly, the prices of using its service have skyrocketed. Um, and some police agencies are being priced out of the the, the ge genetic genealogy investigative business, or at least they can't use it as often as they'd like. And that uh, raises all kinds of questions about, well, you know, should this incredibly valuable uh, law enforcement resource be in private hands like this, or should the you know, police agencies, the FBI or whatever, begin uh, building their own uh, genetic genealogy database so that uh, it's available to every case where it would be applicable. So these are the kinds of questions uh, that, that 
along with the need for some kind of regulation and and um, privacy protections to take us out of what you might call the wild west stage of genealogy where every anything goes um, all that is uh, being being considered and discussed but so far you know only minimal action uh, on any of those those issues has been uh, has taken place yet yeah, that's fascinating um you know I'm, I'm always thinking that i'm i write crime fiction and i'm always thinking about um you know what of course can you take from you know real true crime stories and dramatize it so I'm wondering, just as you were writing this, um, I guess essentially part of my question is this, you know, the, 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 the means of detection here are not like in your traditional, you know, you know, fictional crime stories, most exciting things to dramatize. So I'm wondering how you went about writing this and creating, um, that tension, that drama in your, in your book. Oh, it's, you know, it's actually it seemed one of the more novelistic, uh, true crime stories I, uh, I've, I've ever worked on because there was a lot going on. And the, the initial investigation was fascinating. Um, the search by, Tanya's dad, who tried to find her himself when the police wouldn't take their being missing seriously, uh, was just, he, he's like a figure out of Greek tragedy to me. He was, he, he tried so hard to, to, and wouldn't give up on his, his daughter. Um, it was just a remarkable person. And the, the trial itself, because the jurors were very open with me about how they decided this case was just fascinating. So there was a, there was a lot of drama uh, going on, the, exploring the life of the person, uh, the unlikely suspect who had never committed a, a crime before, who who ended up charged with these violent, horrible murders. Uh, you know, there was there was plenty to write about to to turn this into a, a who done it and a how done it, uh, more so than a lot of true crime kinds of stories that I've I've worked with in the past. So it was, and there's another moment of drama we haven't talked about, but imagine you get a knock on the door one day and you open the door and there's two plainclothes cops standing there with badges on their belts and they say, we're investigating a homicide. We think it's somebody in your family. And you go, what? And they say, yeah, and the reason we, we're we here is because your DNA helped lead us to him, the killer. And you had no idea that was possible. You just wanted to, you know, find out if your family really did have uh, Irish heritage in it or, or not. If the uh, so you took a, a DNA test and unwittingly you've become uh, crowdsourced uh, uh, a criminal investigation that ends up implicating someone you're related to. How do you even react to that? I mean, that is, and that is a, literally the scenario that happened in Jay and Tanya's case and in hundreds of others. Um, so that's kind of a sobering thought that people might want to think about when they <laughs> decide to take these DNA tests that, um, that is one of the many uh, unforeseen secrets that can be exposed when you uh, open this particular Pandora's box. Yeah, that's certainly true. And, you know, certainly beyond just uh, true crime, I think a lot of people are doing this and, and you know, family secrets are, are bubbling to the surface. <laughs> yes. And sometimes, wow, that's really cool. And sometimes it's crushing because, you know, people are learning their 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 father isn't who they thought it was, or, you know, they have relatives, have siblings that they never knew about. And it's, it is, uh, it is quite a journey for some people when they get their test result back, back. And, uh, you know, I, I personally believe knowing the, the truth about things is always a good thing, but it can also be a painful thing for many people and has been. The complex, it's very complex. And there, certainly, you're right, there's so much drama and, and a particularly new kind of emotional complexity around, um, you know, making these discoveries and having to reinterpret the past that way. It's, it's fascinating stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and people have found out wonderful things about that they didn't know about their families and, and have found family they didn't know existed. Ah, oh, just when, uh, woman said, you know, I was adopted and 
in fact, this was a case that C.C. Moore worked at validated her, the method she would use later for solving crimes. But this was a woman who'd been abandoned as a newborn behind a grocery store near Disneyland and never knew who her family was. And she had a wonderful life with her adopted family. But then with C.C. Moore's help, she found her birth family. And she said, wow, now I finally make sense. The way I walk, the way I talk, the fact that I have a sarcastic sense of humor, you know, all these unknown siblings were just like her, and she, you know, and so it wasn't like they filled a hole or anything. She just says, now I make sense to myself. They're like me, and I'm like them. And that was a really wonderful moment for her. So there's a lot of good there, too. Now, they did finally catch the guy, and they arrested him, and it sounds like the trial's been another entertainment show. Uh, coming back and forth and everything. So um, the man that they found and arrested, um, what was his last name, Talbot? Yes, William Earl Talbot. Uh, yeah. Now, so was he known to the fa to, to anybody, any of the victims or their families? Nope. Never a suspect. Had no connection known, at least known, to uh, either Jay or Tanya. Um, he has insisted on his innocence to this day, although at the trial he conceded that it was his DNA uh, found uh, at the crime scenes. His lawyers conceded anyway, but he didn't testify. Yeah, he never, it, 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 well, the, when they held the press conference, Detective Sharp says, yeah, we never would have made this arrest or known about this person if not for the genetic genealogy. So, yeah, he, he was he was the nowhere man as far as this investigation went um, and how exactly their paths cross since he's not talking uh, is not known where exactly where under what circumstances yeah because you, you have no idea what the motive was yeah just you can only the police I think that the sheriff has his theories but um, unless he uh, tells his side of the story we'll, uh, we may never know exactly what happened but um the evidence at the trial suggested that they most likely met somewhere in Seattle and that he uh, used his firearm to to um, force them, uh, the couple, into complying with his demands, which, you know, in, the, in this government's theory of the case, that was having, uh, having Tanya bind uh, Jay and then either being forced to drive their van with the killer inside it uh, somewhere, or um, once Jay was was tied up, that uh, the the killer could tie up Tanya as well, and then take control of the van and go wherever he wished with them and do whatever he wished. So, yeah, uh, we don't really know for sure why, but he yeah, that's one of those. Now that trial, he got convicted originally, but now hasn't it been overturned and it's going for an appeal now? Or it is in the appeals process now. He was convicted of two counts of uh, first-degree murder and sentenced to life without uh, possibility of parole. Um, though there is no death penalty in Washington at this time, so he that was the maximum sentence and his appeal. Uh, to a lower, the, the Court of Appeals in the state of Washington uh, was um, was accepted by by that court on the basis that one of the jurors made statements that made it appear she could have been biased uh, against the defendant. And so the, their decision just focused on that. It didn't have anything to do with genetic genealogy or this being the first trial of which genetic genealogy was introduced. Um, it had nothing to do with the evidence in the case. It was strictly a question about whether or not this juror was biased. Now, the state Supreme Court has just had uh, uh, recently oral arguments in the case, and they several of the justices on that court were very skeptical of this decision. They, they said, well, wait a minute, you could have had this juror removed, and you didn't. Um, this is to the defense attorneys. Why, why should we now... Uh, you know, since you chose to accept the jury with that person on it, why are we now in a position where you're not accepting them after the fact? 
Um, so it's unclear where this is going to go, but uh, either way, the appeals will probably continue for some time because that's that's the way things work out in our justice system. There's uh, often a lot of layers of review to make sure the right decision was was reached, and that's and that's a good thing. But that's still unfolding. Let's 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 talk about you. So. Do you interact with uh, fans on social media? Do you have a website? Where do people find you? I'm pretty easy to find, and the answer to all those questions is yes. I do have a website. It's simply my name, edwardhumes.com, and you can find me through my name uh, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm pretty pretty easy to find, and the Forever Witness is uh, available everywhere. And this is kind of cool, uh, a little scary for me. For the first time, this is my 16th book, but it's the first time I've narrated the audiobook. So uh, we'll see if I ever do it again or not, depending on how people feel about it. Yeah, that's a lot of work. I know. I have so much respect for people who do this for a living. Wow. And... Uh, I have new and renewed respect for writing with short sentences because <laughs> when you read it out loud, you say, hmm, maybe I could have written that a little bit better. Uh, yeah. But it was, all in all, it was pretty pretty cool to, to do and to, to have that opportunity. So Okay, well, we'll have everything up on our website as well. People can find the book, find you in one click, um, so it makes it easy for them. Um, what 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 is the... Um, atmosphere around uh, Snohomish and King County and around Seattle about this case? Is there any sort of public opinion or any talk locally? Or uh, Yeah. I mean, the, the trial, well, and the arrest and then the trial were thoroughly covered by all media in the, in the region uh, and also in Canada. Uh, it was a real cause celeb there. And they had not had any genetic genealogy cases there when this unfolded. And so there was a national debate about, about using that technology there and the privacy aspects of it. But I believe that they have since allowed um, their own um, genetic genealogy investigations on that side of the border. So that was really interesting. I, I in Snohomish County is one is just, uh, north of of King County, where Seattle is, and it's it it it's, has urban areas, but also uh, rural. Uh, and I I think they were took a lot of pride in the fact that their relatively small sheriff's department has is a is a cold case trailblazer, and that uh, has has had remarkable <laughs> success uh, uh, in 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 that area for, for department with its resources. So that's, uh, that's been, been something that's been quite uh, talked about. I did an event with spot, a virtual event with sponsored by the uh, Everett public library in Snohomish County. And that was, that was really fun and interesting and lots of great questions. Well, this was, I believe, wasn't this the very first case tried and convicted using um, no only DNA as a witness to the to the criminal, this was the first trial where uh, that was solved through genetic genealogy. Yeah, that was, and um, it was the, it was the second arrest and the first to go to trial, and the one that sort of triggered this. Um, you know, it seemed to become a weekly event, and still is of cold cases being solved this way that had, had languished for years. So it was a really uh, key development in the in, in this this uh, yeah. this avalanche of, of uh, cold case solutions that have flowed from from that day in uh, 2018 well fascinating case and a fascinating book everyone you must pick it up you want to find this out um, the forever witness and uh, the guest is the author Edward Humes. Thank you for being here. My pleasure, Al. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. 
I'll be back.